I think we need to start. What percentage of people do you think attend church in the Shenandoah Valley? What's your guess? There is. Well, it's about 17 or 18 percent. I, uh, I was nurtured in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, which is supposed to be the hotbed for religion uh, with the Anabaptists. Last weekend, I spent uh, the weekend there kind of with, working with the congregation and found out in a recent survey among the newspaper of Lancaster County, 18 percent of the people attend church or synagogue in, uh, in, in that county. If you, 15, 20 years ago, as a pastor, I expect the visitors to show up at church for church service. Pastoring today, you cannot expect to grow your church with people coming to visit you. Today, we are called to be a missional church and that is to turn ourselves outward and get out of the community and do our evangelism out there. And then get them. So I'll begin with a story. I have a, was in Kansas doing a workshop and a guy got turned on. And he came out, he's a one-armed man. But a brute of the strength of a person was a logger, etc., etc. He went back home to Nebraska, and three months later, I got a call one day in Ohio, and here's this guy in Nebraska. He said, Fred, you've got to help me. Help you do what? He said, I'm in uncharted territory. I'm writing a new, I'm writing a new chapter, and I don't know where to go or how to go. I said, what happened? He said, well, some guy, some ruffian got killed in our community, and he said they asked, they didn't have a preacher, so they asked me to do the service, and I did the service, and he said all these ruffians from the community came and showed up at church, and on the way out they said, hey, brother, we'd like to hear more about what you're talking about, but we ain't coming to your church to hear anything or any other church. Well, he said, can I meet with you somewhere? They said, sure. If you come down to the bar and meet us on Thursday night, we'll sit and listen to your story. And indeed, that's what happened. And he had Bible study with them, drank iced tea while they drank beer. It took a year before those men started, one by one, coming to church. Relationship building, relationship building. Read the story in, in Luke 19 with Zacchaeus and Jesus. Zacchaeus would have never been expected to show up in a synagogue because he was that much hated by religious people. If you read Luke 10 and Luke, Luke 18, Luke makes two references to putting two people, two groups of people together, sinners and tax collectors. He is the most hated person, and he's the chief tax collector. And look what Jesus does when he passes by Zach. He doesn't look up in the tree and say, Zach, come to synagogue on Sunday. And he doesn't say, Zach, are you saved? Doesn't do any of that. Rather, he does the one thing that Zacchaeus needs, because Zach never has anybody coming to his house for lunch because nobody will show up there. So Jesus says, I can't come to your house today for lunch. And because of that act of kindness and building relationship, Zacchaeus has went into the kingdom. That's what this is all about. Yes. Growing congregations almost always have many members who are inviting persons outside the church to come to church activities. Let's look at what growing congregations versus declining congregations do. They talk about their faith with anyone in any setting unless doing so is clearly prohibited. Let me just say 
by way that I have done more witnessing in bars in the golf course in restaurants and many other places in the social life of the community than I have in church I preach the good news in church I try to live it out during the week with people I meet and I'm discovering over and over and over again the name of the game is building relationships Amen. and the people we're trying to rescue are always testing us to see how far we will go with our faith to be faithful in terms of building relationships with them that's right is that right that's right for our Amen. Amen. 17 percent of people in growing congregations talk about their faith Six percent in declining congregations. Talking about their personal faith with others in class or group settings of a congregation and growing congregations, 83 percent. What's your guess? 51 percent in declining congregations. People who are on fire for the Lord make a difference in their communities. Personally sharing your faith on a frequent basis with persons outside the congregation, having done so at least a dozen times over the past year. What's your guess? Well, in growing congregations, 33% do. In declining congregations, only 6%. If we are so on fire for the Lord, why are we so timid about sharing what we believe and our faith in Jesus Christ. We sang this morning, Jesus is the most precious name we can utter on our lips. Amen. Why aren't we talking about Jesus? Amen. Why is the fastest growing religion in America Islam? Why? Why is Christianity declining? Because we're hiding it under a bushel. I think our master had something to say about that, didn't he? Hiding the light under a bushel. Persons invited on at least a dozen occasions over the past year, persons outside the congregation to participate in worship or other church activities. The percentage in growing congregations is 53%, and declining congregations. 14%. These figures don't lie, and they tell us about ourselves. Personally extending greetings to persons who are guests in the congregation, whether they know those persons or not. Now we're talking about hospitality. Good old biblical hospitality. Making people feel welcome. Treating people as guests not visitors. All right? Growing congregations, they got the handout. 94%. And a few huggers. <laughs> <laughs> Declining congregations, 76%. Years ago, in my first interim pastor, to prove whether I could be a pastor or not in Southern Virginia, down at Bassett, Mount Hermon. The person who took me under his wing was a guy in your district, Dick Gottschall. He still lives. Oh, yeah. Dick said to me one day, Fred, the church is no stronger than your weakest link. Uh, I've been thinking about that ever since. Personally going out of their way to extend greetings to visitors, even if that means separating for a time from church friends in order to seek out the newcomers. Well, what do you think? 81% growing congregations, 20% in declining congregations. Talking about a weakest link. Read the, Joyce and I read the paper one day that they were having a pot pie supper in the church, church and brother. We said, hey, we'd like to go. So we knew another couple in that community and invited them to go along. We got there, and instead of somebody shaking our hand, the person said, 
I want money. I thought we paid for the meal. Is this a church of the brethren? Then we get up to the line, and this is how it started. This was a cafeteria line. She had a kitchen in the back with a rail with bars out front where you slid your tray along, like you do in a school cafeteria. Mm -hmm. Person behind the counter who was dipping the pot pie said, to the first person, it was our foursome. <coughs> we're running out of pot pie. Mm -hmm. Second person, we're about out of pot pie. <laughs> Third person, my wife. She said, well, since you're running out of pot pie, just give me half a bowl. So she got one piece of pot pie and all the rest. Well, that time I had gotten a message. <laughs> so I said, well, since you have a little broth, just give me a little broth. I'll be happy. To all four of us, she said, we're running out of pot pie. We went through the line, had to pay extra for the dessert. Went to a table and sat down at the table, and we were eating. Now, this was halfway during the time that this was supposed to be going on. It was supposed to be from 3 to 7. We got there about 4.15. So I don't know what happened to the people after us. <laughs> <laughs> what I do know is that no sooner we sat down and started to eat, and I discovered this afterward when I learned to know who this person was, a person from the congregation walked up, looked at us, and looked straight at me, and said, you homes are eating it all. That's honest. You hogs are eating it all. To this day, I don't know whether he was serious or kidding. All I know is I can feel the blood going up. When I told the pastor a few days later, he shared something with me that even made the blood boil more. He said that particular person who shared that with me already had 10 bowls of pot pie. Oh. Now this was to be a community event in order to bring people from the community to introduce them to the church. If somebody said that to you, would you go back? No. Hospitality is still the name of the game. Top nine reasons for not reaching out. These are excuses. I'm afraid I'll look foolish if I talk about my faith. I don't have friends who aren't already members of a church. <laughs> Worked with a church in Indiana at a board meeting, and they said they wanted to grow. Um, at least that's what the pastor told me. But when I got there and met with the church board, we were in a session. And I asked a question and said, uh, when's the last time you had a visitor? And one precious soul spoke up and said, who said we want visitors? <laughs> <laughs> and then went on to say, we're pretty satisfied the way we are. I have a friend by the name of Bill. Bill can't read or write, but he has the love of Jesus in his heart. And he has brought more people to Christ over the years than anybody else I know. We would say he's foolish and dumb. He doesn't know that. He just knows he loves Jesus. Amen. Amen. I'm not convinced people outside the Christian faith are going to hell, so I don't know how to approach them. <laughs> wow. It seems like too personal a topic. We'll stay away from it. Like death, or sex, or money. I don't want to admit it, but I'm afraid of growth. I like the church as it is right now, and I'm not sure I want new people. Well, we just talked about that. 
I'll take the peace and I take the peace and justice emphasis of my denomination seriously. But I sometimes feel like there is a conflict between that and evangelism. Um, quite a number of us from the Anabaptist tradition who are peacemakers are afraid to talk about peacemaking in positive ways. But peacemaking is one of the most powerful messages. And Jeremy can back this up which young people outside the church are craving for. Mm. They want to hear that message. I'd like to share my faith, but I'm just too busy. There isn't enough time to do it. Well, I want to say that this year are the more opportunity you have for sharing your faith. That's right. I've heard people say so many negative things about the church and the Christian faith that the idea of sharing my faith or inviting someone to church doesn't seem realistic to me. Hmm. I think there's a bottom line there. It's a line I've heard of many, many times over. The line is, I don't feel good about my congregation. How can I invite somebody to come here? <laughs> Attitude. Yeah. Attitude. It's not just practice. Practice grows out of our attitudes about life, about the church, about God, about Christ, the Holy Spirit. I think there's so much wrong with my church that it wouldn't be right to ask someone to join. I need mean, to feel excited about my church before asking somebody else to be a part of it. This church just isn't spiritual anymore, or the pastor isn't spiritual anymore. Never take that at face value. There's always something hidden underneath. Try to get to what's underneath. They'll finally cough it up. <laughs> Good evangelism is often a waiting game. Not an assertive and aggressive contest. When fishing for people, we shouldn't try to coerce the catch. But just like a good fisherman, take your time and let the nibbles come. People have to wait to take the bait, filled in this by inviting people to come and see, come and see. Jesus teaches that our vocation is to touch people, to create a climate of change, offering hope, <coughs> renewal, healing, encouragement, forgiveness. You notice there's a word missing, which may I hear often in churches from preachers, and the word is condemnation. Renewal, healing, encouragement. How do you help children along the way? Personal gain for talking about what we believe. Talking about our faith pushes us to think about what we believe in different ways. We learn from others in the process. Praying for the well-being of others. This story of Philip. The next day, Jesus decided to leave from Galilee, finding Philip, and said to him, Follow me. Philip, like Andrew and Peter, was from the town of Bethesda. Philip found Nathaniel and told him, We have found the one Moses wrote about in the law, and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, son of Joseph. Nazareth. Can anything good come from there? Nathaniel asked. <coughs> come and see, said Philip. Jesus saw Nathanael approaching, he said of him, Here is a true Israelite in whom there is nothing false. How do you know me? Nathanael asked. Jesus answered, I saw you while you were still under the fig tree before Philip called you. Then Nathanael declared, Rabbi, you are the Son of God, you are the King of Israel. Jesus said, You believe because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You shall see greater things than that. He then asked, I tell you the truth, you shall see heaven open and the angel of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Faith sharing always takes place in the context of an established relationship. I also like the story of Nathan and David. Had not Nathan had a relationship with David, could have never confronted David about his sin. 
relationship, relationship, relationship. It is extremely important to respect the right of others to see the world differently than we do and to express their beliefs differently than we choose to do. We are called to share the faith we have received. We are not called to impose it. Sharing is different than imposing. You don't have to believe the same way I believe. You don't have to attend church the same way I attend. But hopefully, we can hear each other's stories, and sooner or later I can tell you how much the love of Jesus means in my heart and in my life, and how it's changed me drastically. Rescuing the church is never a motive for reaching out to others. I want you to read that. Say it with me. Rescuing the church is never a motive for reaching out to others. What is? The good news of the gospel is meant to be shared, not hoarded. I like that picture. We can comfortably relate our faith to Christ and others and invite others into that life of the church through a process that includes these. Number one, forming meaningful relationships with others and broadening our circle of friends. Listening to others and understanding their needs. Listening. Listening. Caring. Both in our words and actions. Telling in our own words how Christ and the church have made a difference in our lives. Key word there is in our own words, not in the words prescribed for us by someone else. What's in here? What's in here? And can you tell it? And it doesn't have to sound good to you. If it's genuine and from the heart, it will be communicated. Amen. Inviting others into the life of the uh, we can comfortably relate our faith to Christ and others invite others into the life of the church. Through a process that includes inviting others into the life of the congregation, extending meaningful hospitality that truly integrates new people into the congregation, recognizing that it is Christ who saves and that we must respect where others are and open us to Christ in the church. We are not the saviors. And we are not the convictors. If you read the New Testament, who's the convictor? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Understanding people outside the church. It's pretty much an eye opener. People who identify with the Christian faith. These are from the Gallup Poll Pew Forum Barna Organization and Christian Communities Research. People who identify with Christian faith, 78% of the nation say they do. People who identify with a different faith, 9%. No faith? 13%. Atheist people who believe in reincarnation, the unifying force, or the ability of pausing thinking. They do believe something. They just don't believe in what we believe. But 50%. Can you believe that? People who claim to be a church or synagogue member, 63%. Yet we said only 18% attend church or synagogue. People who say they're in a church on a typical Sunday, that's wrong. That's what they say. Right <laughs> through. <laughs> People who say they pray several times a week, 80 to 95%. In our time, the primary difficulty isn't how people feel about God. It's about how people feel about the church. Many who become affiliated with the church say they did, they did so because they think of religious people as hypocritical or judgmental because religious organizations focus too much on rules and because religious leaders are too focused on power and money. 
And if you read Barna's research, uh, that's pretty clear. Uh, young people between the ages of 19 and 26, uh, almost 90% <coughs> say they feel the church is too judgmental. This persons who would be encountered negatively in the church. Well, you have your own list. And uh, you probably want to trade them with some other pastor. 19 through 35, 68%. Local church is too much like an institution or a bureaucracy. About 19 through 35 members, 61%. Wow. How about members 36 and over? Well, they're pretty much in the system and they're the ones running the church, so. They don't believe the church is too much like a bureaucracy. You can be a good Christian even though you don't belong to a local church. 86%. That's a high percentage. We have our work cut out for us, don't we? 73% who are members. And those over 36, 21%. It's very clear from these statistics that there's a disparity between persons my age and persons Jeremy and younger in how they feel about the organized church. It also helps us to understand why house churches are springing up all over the country. Because people feel more comfortable going to a house church with friends than they do going into a steeple church. Or as brothers say, big kitchen churches. <laughs> <laughs> Understanding religious language. We often use that term. What does it mean? <clears throat> Made whole. It's easy for me to talk with people about how are you feeling? How are you really feeling? Do you feel like a whole person? It keeps you away from the religious jar and it turns them off. What's sin? Sin is simply missing the mark. But it has devastating results, doesn't it? Yes. And all of us know we miss the mark from time to time. Well, we all know what the good gospel is. It's the good news. Everyone wants to hear good news. Wouldn't it be nice if we could hear some good news on the newscast each night? <laughs> Evangelism is simply telling or sharing that good news, both in word and in deed. Everyone knows about and understands brokenness and wholeness, failures, Shortcomings, these are all uh, generic words which we use in everyday life. But they communicate the good news. All of us want to hear the good news. Christians can share happy good news. <laughs> can we? John, one that you told me you said to a person. <laughs> Oh, no, I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, I did. Go ahead. Why don't you share your face? Why don't you share your face? You're happy. If you're happy, why don't you share that on your face? Or something like that? <laughs> what I said was I was in a meeting at a church that will be unknown. And I walked in, and it was the middle of the afternoon on a Sunday. And I left the lady, nice lady, was sitting there like this. And I said, do you love Jesus? And, yes. <laughs> and I could not hold myself from saying it. I said, well then, why don't you tell your face? <laughs> process her total demeanor changed and she became 
vibrant, joyful, and engaged in conversations. And she came up there and told me, this was the most fun I've had in church in decades. <laughs> Years ago, my dad was a free minister. He said, if Christians can't be happy, who can be? Yes, that's right. Reasons for faith sharing. Because God wants us to. What's the Great Commission? Teach and baptize. People are hungry for meaningful connections. We know that people between the ages of 19 and 25 are hungry, are hungry for connections. They want meaningful relationships. They're not getting it in the church, but they are getting it. How many of you have grandchildren that are texting all the time? <laughs> Why do you think they're doing that? Be in relationship. All ages need opportunities to grow their faith. No matter how young or how old. The people need opportunities to work for peace and justice. People need a faith community to help them through their difficult times. And by the way, it's through the difficult times that the church can often be the catalyst which brings people to the life of faith in Christ. Because when people are hurting, that's when they most receive uh, reaching out, <coughs> caring, and sharing. Jesus commanded us to reach out and to make disciples. The church needs the energy and ideas that new people bring. I say every church needs visitors every time you have a worship service. They keep you on your toes. And they bring you new ideas, and they help you become a more vibrant faith community. And we all know that new people in congregations are your best evangelists. Wonder why. God blesses our lives through new persons who become our faith friends. Church growth study results. Major junctions when persons with spiritual uh, will, will discuss spiritual issues. Marriage, moving, changing job. John Savage says for every time, for every year you have a person that is inactive in the life of the church, it takes at least one visit for a year of inactivity to bring that person back. And in his in his doctoral presentation, he says something interesting. He said, what they will tell you as a defining moment that led them to discontinue their relationship with the church, it probably will not make sense to you, and you will not understand it. Never put it down and say, oh, well, you shouldn't feel that way. Because that's exactly how they feel. Rather, affirm their feeling and keep on listening to try to pull out more. Tell me more about it. What do you think about it? How did you learn to? Finish the sentence. How would you describe it? Other open-ended questions based on what persons have said. What kind of experience did you have in the church you grew up in? What caused you to drop out of church involvement? What happened that caused you to feel negative about the church and the Christian faith? What made you doubt the existence of God? You shared that you felt God's presence more in the natural world than in any church service. That's why I go hunting on Sunday. Because I experienced God out in the woods. <laughs> How would you describe the experience you've had of God's presence in the natural in the natural world. Draw them out. Yes, sir. Yeah. And when you learn what tick, what makes them tick, you'll say to yourself, well, that's what makes me tick when I go to 
church and then share with them what makes you what makes you come alive in a worship service. You share the song Jesus Loves Me seems to embody the most important things about your faith. How would you describe those things? Effective evangelism means holding in tension these two things. The sincere desire to help others in the name of Jesus and the sincere desire to let people know what Christ in the church can mean for their lives. <clears throat> the five greatest needs of people in your community, what are they? Some years ago, in the church I pastored, we sent persons out two by two one Saturday morning in our community to knock on doors and ask three questions. Do you have any needs? Uh, do you know where they can be met? And number three, if our church provided a way to help with that need, would you attend or would you, would you receive it? And we came up with all kinds of ministries to our community because of those three questions. Parenting, divorce, grief loss, stress, preschool parenting, empty nesters, simple life promotion, media impact, financial planning, film production, teenage sexuality, teenage spirituality, teenage yeah. Yeah. <laughs> teenage film series. <laughs> Don't jump to conclusions. Be judgmental. Sign blame. Interrupt. Miss hearing what is really being said. Give advice. Do encourage persons to tell you more. Pay attention to body language. Maintain eye contact. Listen to the tone of voice. Keep an attitude of prayer. Went too far. I'm finished, John. Earl. That's good. Right on time. Right on time.